Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our church service today. We love that we get a chance to be with you online. You're going to get the most out of today by pairing this broadcast experience with our app. So take a moment, download the app, and explore the features that you can use to follow along, like a response card, notes section, and Bible. If you want to be a part of the movement at Grace Church and further the work that God's doing through services just like this one, you can give right on our website or through your app. It's easy, safe, and quick. Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year, filled with moments that create memories. We often paint a picture in our minds of what Christmas is. Christmas cards, parties, meals, and of course, presents. The older we get, the more Christmas becomes all about what we think it should be. This year, let's look for more than the magic and wonder around us. This year, let's celebrate a Not About Me Christmas. Well, good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Man, can you believe it's Christmas? Even if we don't like it, uh, Christmas kind of steamrolls right over Thanksgiving these days, doesn't it? Uh, I'm glad that you're here, and I wonder uh, what your favorite things about Christmas are. Maybe uh, you have a favorite Christmas carol. Do you have a favorite Christmas carol? I want you to think of that, and I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to sing. No, I really don't. I just want you to tell them your favorite Christmas carol. Go ahead and do that. Your favorite Christmas carol. I think I hear somebody singing it. Stop. You're making the rest of us look bad, right? No, no. Now, we all have favorite things about Christmas, but I was uh, looking at a research this week by Harvard Business Review, and they declared that the number one Christmas carol for Americans at this time of year should be, tis the season to be selfish. Whoa, man, wait a minute, what? It's supposed to be a season of giving, right? But no, maybe it's not. As a matter of fact, CNBC did a report this week that millennials have become more selfish than anyone before them. As a matter of fact, millennials now spend more on themselves at Christmas than they spend on other people, and they give it a name. It's called self-gifting. Self-gifting, that doesn't exist. Those are oxymorons, but whatever, you know. Christmas, while it's supposed to be that time of year that's all about cheer and giving, it can be a very, very, very selfish time of year, can't it? And today, we're kicking off a new series called It's Not About Me, Christmas. What would it look like if in 2017 you could flip your Christmas upside down? And it wouldn't be all about you, but instead it would be about Jesus and be about other people. That's what we're talking about in this series. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning and learn how to turn our Christmas upside down. You know, uh, we all can have that little selfish streak when it comes to Christmas about gifts and everything. And there was one a popular uh, London retail store, Harvey Nichols, that decided to build off of the trend of our selfishness. And a few years ago, they came out with an ad campaign at Christmas called Sorry, I Spent It On Myself. And you could buy really cheap gifts. Well, I just want you to watch the ad. Check out what happened at Harvey Nichols in England. Christmas is all about giving, sharing, and caring. But at Harvey Nichols, the UK's leading luxury fashion retailer, it's all about me, me, me. To help our customers out, we invented a new line of products for the festive season, the Sorry I Spent It On Myself gift collection. A range of budget presents that we created specially so people could spend less on others and more on themselves. We made the range available at all Harvey Nichols stores across the UK, as well as online. Must-have items included an elastic band gift set, a waterproof sink plug, and a bag of gravel. We even produced a Christmas lunch in a tin and boxes of crackers, complete with hats and jokes, but not gifts or bangs, obviously. And for the truly selfish, we created a free downloadable Christmas card. We announced the range to the public with a print campaign and a promotional film that was seeded online. Christmas lunch in a tin with most of the trimmings. The internet went crazy for it. 
as did the media. Despite only having a fraction of the budget of their competitors, it was the most controversial Christmas campaign of the year. Most importantly of all, the customers loved it too. The entire range, just short of 20,000 products, sold out within three days, and Harvey Nichols went on to have one of their best Christmases to date. I love that line, it'll make you despair for humanity, right? You could buy a paper clip and on the, or a box of paper clips and on the back it would say, sorry, I spent it on myself, right? The epitome of selfishness, right? And so I was doing even more research on gifts that you could buy that if you bought them for somebody, you might think, you know what? I think I'll keep that for myself. And so here are a few that I found. I, I found this one. This is a lock with a code on your Ben and Jerry's ice cream container, right? Like if you found that on, I think that's pretty good. You'd be like, you know what? I'm not giving that to anybody in my family. I'm keeping that for myself, right? And, and then there's this mug, right? Mine. It just absolutely declares, maybe some of you need this in your office, okay? And then I found one that my, my son would love because he is a, a fan of tacos. There's no we in tacos, right? It all belongs to me. And then if you're married uh, and your spouse, I won't even ask you to raise hands, don't because you could be in trouble. But I wonder if you have a spouse that takes up more than half of the bed, if you know what I'm talking about. Found the perfect pillows, right? There's mine and, and clearly the pillow ends right here. And the E is also over here, right? Because, but if you find those, you just might want to absolutely keep them for yourself, right? Maybe it's a selfish gift, or maybe it's just, you know, you want to buy a gift for yourself, or you want to keep it for yourself, but Christmas can quickly become selfish. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you don't have a problem giving away gifts. But the selfish part of Christmas comes in with expectations, you have really high expectations for the experience. And you want to build it up and you want it to go exactly how you think it should. You should eat this meal and it should be with these people and they should all be here and every kid will smile for the picture, right? Your expectations are through the roof. And when it doesn't happen, you get mad. And don't realize that quickly Christmas can become all about me than all about you. See, I think a problem that we have, and I'm going to share with you why I think this happens, is, is right here. I think we try to get out of Christmas what we can only find in Christ. Whether it's that, that gift that we feel is going to satisfy our soul, or whether it's the gathering of our family that we feel will just make us whole. We're trying to get out of a holiday what can only be found in a person. And if we miss that, we're going to miss Christmas. We're going to miss out on the meaning of life as well. We're trying in the shopping and buying gifts and pageants and parties and lights and trees and photos and memories. We're trying to find peace and happiness and joy and meaning. But what if it comes from the true meaning of Christmas rather than all the build-up expectation of Christmas? In the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is kind of giving a defense of his ministry to his readers. And he tells them, he kind of chronicles some wins that he has, and he tells them about his current circumstances in the book. And, and then he basically says, hey, listen, I want to tell you where my confidence comes from. He says, my confidence comes from the fact that I know the real meaning of Christmas. Well, he doesn't say that. He goes, I know the real meaning of life and is found in Christ. And in chapter 3, where we are, we pick up the story with him comparing two different promises. An old promise and a new promise. We call it the old covenant and the new covenant. And in the old covenant or promise, there's a key figure and it's Moses. And there's a really big moment and it's called the Ten Commandments. It's where God wrote his law on stone. And humans realized that they couldn't keep that law. We're not perfect. And so that brought death. And the glory of that promise was fading. And Paul compares that with the fulfillment of that promise, which is in the new covenant or the new promise. And the key figure of that is Jesus. And the key moment of that is the resurrection when he came back to life after he was crucified on the cross. And now God's promise, no longer written on stone and tablets, is written on hearts and lives. 
It brings us hope and meaning and significance in life, and it has a glory that is surpassing. And Paul says, hey, listen, Jesus, uh, who came as a baby and died in our place and rose from the dead, he made it so that we don't have to have something special to get to God. We don't have to follow all the rules because we never can. We don't have to do all the rituals because that doesn't cut it. Instead, we can have a relationship with God Because of Christ. And so, if we have that relationship, we find the true meaning, not just of life, but also of Christmas. And when we have a relationship with God through Christ, we see the glory of God. The glory of God. And in the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says this. He says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, highlight that or underline that in your Bible, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. Today we're going to land on that phrase, contemplate the Lord's glory. We're going to build the whole talk around it. Uh, Glory, if we work our way back through it, glory means fame or honor or praise. And and listen, it, it means that God gets the place that he deserves, which is the top spot, because he is the author and the creator of life. He is holy. He is perfect. He's not like us. And he basically reminds us, hey, listen, life, it already has a main character. There's already a star. There's already an MVP. His name is Jesus, and he's not going to share his glory with anybody. Not even with a holiday, he doesn't share his glory with anybody. And over 2,000 years ago, when the main character in life story stepped onto the scene in the form of a baby, everything changed. And Paul says, I want you to, to contemplate that. I want you to contemplate the Lord's glory. When he says contemplate, uh, there's a couple different meanings of that word. It can mean to behold or kind of take it all in, or it can mean to reflect or to do something with it. Listen, it's easy to make life and to make Christmas all about me. It can be all about my dreams, all about my expectations, all about my hopes and wishes. But the way to turn your Christmas upside down and to really go for the countercultural Christmas experience, or dare I even call it the real one, it requires contemplating the glory of the Lord. And from that little phrase, we find two very key characteristics in how to turn that Christmas upside down and have a not about me Christmas. I want you, if you're a note taker, to take these notes. First one is this, that first we need to resemble Jesus. We need to resemble Jesus. Well, one of the craziest moments I've ever had in my life is when I was at Ohio State University. I just had to drop that name in the sermon today because there was a game yesterday I heard about. But anyway, I was at Ohio State University, and I was at an event, and I was with some friends. And all of a sudden, a woman comes running towards me uh, up these steps, and she has a program in her hand and a pen, and she hands it to me, and she goes, Can I have your autograph, please? And I thought, Sure. And so I wrote Pastor Nick. No, I didn't. I had no idea what she wanted. I'm like, excuse me? And she's like, well, you're him, right? And I'm like, who? And she goes, you're Chris Spielman, right? True story. It's a true story. Now, if you don't know who Chris Spielman is, allow me. Okay? This guy is a starting linebacker in the 80s for the Buckeyes, played in the NFL. No? No? I had to let this lady down easy, man. I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not. And she goes, no, you really are. I'm like, no, really, I really want to sign this just for kicks, but I'm not going to, right? And so she saw the resemblance, even though you might not, but she did, and that's cool. She's one of my favorite people of all time. I have no idea who she is. But it got me to thinking about resembling, and then it got me to thinking about our staff, and who they might look like, okay? And so I asked a few of our really techie people, and they helped me out uh, getting some resemblances together, and I have 50 of them ready to go this morning for you. Uh, I'm only going to share a few. Uh, But I'll start with myself, right? Some people have told me, okay, you might not look like Chris Spielman, but you sure do look like the Cavs' former coach, David Blatt, okay? Which I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. I I know I'll take his contract. But um, then I realized that's kind of scary because I think David Blatt looks a little bit like Vladimir Putin. And 
No, no way. Okay. But then I thought, well, how about Matt Carter, right? Anybody see the resemblance? Yeah, just a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay. It's, it, uh, he'll get over it. All right. Pastor Bob. Now get ready. Get ready because this one's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a perfect resemblance. Man, am I glad he's on sabbatical. Anyway, um, I hope he's tuning in. Uh, and then there's Billy Starkey. And, uh, huh? Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to know why he gets somebody cool, right? I get Vladimir Putin. Anyway. And then this is uh, Terry Carter, our facilities director. Uh, check out the lips. It's going to be in the lips. Yeah, Conway Twitty. Wow, yeah. So if you see a guy walking around the building, you know, singing, maybe that's Terry. Uh, and then there's Jake Lawson on our Next Steps team. I can't tell if this is a look-alike or a beard-alike. Yeah? Yeah, Zach McAllister. You're like, wow, that's pretty good. That's amazing. And, and then Jeff Walter, our operations director, who, if you haven't seen Jeff today, he has a full beard, and I really think he looks like the brawny man, to just hand him a set of paper towels. But we actually think without that, oh, yeah, yeah. It gets better. It gets better. I got more. How about his whole family? A little royal family action there, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't tell Jeff. He'll get a really big head, and it'll be really, really crazy. But okay, so I'll stop because some of you want me to go on, but I can't. Here's the point. What if we tossed Jesus up there and then put our picture next to it? Would our life resemble the life of Christ. Because when you contemplate the glory of the Lord, which Paul told us to do, when you contemplate the glory of the Lord and you're being transformed into his image, it comes with an ever-increasing glory. And the Lord who is spirit, the spirit of God is changing you to look more like Jesus if you're a follower of Christ. So if I put Jesus' picture up there and mine right next to it, would there be a resemblance more in just the feature, but in the character? Do we really truly resemble Jesus? That's what Paul means when he says contemplate, to behold it, to fix our eyes on exactly who God is, his nature and his character. Want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. What if... In Wayne County, we could say to our county, you want to know what God looks like? Look at me. Because I'm being changed into his image. Now, at Christmas time, to stop and contemplate, that's a little overwhelming. But have you stopped recently and took a long, hard look at who Jesus is? And said, man... Where do I need God's Spirit to do some work in my life? See, Jesus, John told us, uh, came as God in flesh. Paul told us in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That he came to earth, he lived the best life we could ever live as an example, as a model for us. And so Paul says, hey, stop, pause, look, contemplate the glory of God. Contemplate the fame of God. Contemplate Jesus because he is the glory of God. Yeah, but I'm so busy. I got another text to send or an email to, to respond to or a card to write or a present to get or one to wrap or a gift card to pick up on the way or a party to get to. Or an event to be at and plan. What? I don't have time to pause, to hit pause on the chaos and ponder Christ. I don't have time for that. That turns it into an it's an all about me Christmas. Rather than it's a not about me Christmas. Some of you are counting on someone else to, to help you look more like Jesus. You're counting on some author or speaker or TV person or some Christian radio or Christian TV person uh, to be responsible for your spiritual growth. Hey, listen, nobody in this world is responsible for your spiritual growth but you. We are responsible ourselves because we have two keys. One is the Word of God right here, and the other is the Spirit of God who, when we become a follower of Christ, resides in us. And he is the one, Paul says, that is transforming us into the image of Christ. 
And so we have to get out of the way and let the Spirit work in our lives, give Him free access and reign and leadership of our life. So maybe for you, a Not About Me Christmas would begin by putting yourself in a place that you can be changed. See, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us like the Son of God. So maybe you need to be spending time in the Word this Christmas, spending time in the Bible. And we have many ways for you to do that. As a matter of fact, this morning we launched a brand new devotional series on our site, Every Day with God. If you have the Grace Church app, you can access that right now. You can sign up for that. If you need help, go to a Next Steps kiosk in the lobby after the services this morning. And say, hey, I want that Bible reading plan. I need some help. And every day, a reading devotional will come to your inbox so that you can start your day by contemplating the glory of the Lord. So you can turn your Christmas upside down. And I'm telling you, that's where you're going to find a meaningful Christmas. Paul said, contemplate the glory of the Lord. Resemble Jesus. You want a litmus test on whether or not you're resembling Jesus or your passion is white hot for God? Examine how you're treating other people. If you fail in the compassion test, you fail in the passion test. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Beholding the glory of the Lord or of God drives you to extending the grace of God to other people. If you want to look like Jesus, you need to live like Jesus, which means you have to love like Jesus. He's a loving God. And Paul said, hey, resemble Jesus. Contemplate the glory of the Lord. First key to an it's a not about me Christmas. Second key is to reflect Jesus. It's to reflect Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but mirrors aren't One of my favorite things in the world. It's not my favorite thing ever, really. And and most of us don't like mirrors, right? Because they tell the truth in a rather harsh tone, right? You look in and you're like, whoa, (laughs) you know? And so you can see all the imperfections. You can see where your hair is not right. You can see, you know, is that really my nose? And what's going on up here? I kind of just don't like everything right here, you know? And some of you stare forever in there because you're worried about the imperfections that I can't stand being in front of a mirror. And some of you are like, yeah, we can tell, you know, no kidding, right? None of us really like that because it tells us exactly who we are. And yet, if we were to stand in front of this as though the mirror was Jesus and we were to look into it, do we see him reflecting in our own life? Where do we see that we don't measure up? Where do we need to let the Spirit of God have more access in our world? Paul said, contemplate the Lord's glory. Resembling Jesus always leads to reflecting Jesus. And we live in a world that is dying and without hope. Paul actually says that they have spiritual blinders on. Their hearts are veiled before God because they can't get to God. They can't have that relationship with God. And the mandate is clear from Paul that we need to reflect the hope that is found in Christ. Our mission is abundantly clear. It's not up for debate. I don't care what your favorite author says. I don't care what blog you read. I don't care who you watch on TV. The mission is not up for debate. As a matter of fact, we'll just go straight to Jesus. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's the mission. Period. It's to reflect Jesus to other people. Let me tell you. I've been a follower of Christ for over 30 years. And here's one thing I've learned about Christians. We have mission ADD. We fall for it all the time. We are so easily distracted from what God has called us to do on this planet. Really good things that we get distracted with. But this is the main thing. And he's invited us into this mission. So this Christmas, if you want to make it not about you, you got to ask... Have I been distracted from the main thing? Have I missed the point? You know how to check whether you've been distracted from the main thing? Recall your stories of reflecting the greatness of Jesus. 
are they old or are they new? If your stories are old about serving and loving and reflecting Jesus to other people and sharing the reason for the hope that you have, if those stories are old, you're failing the test. That's not reflecting Jesus. Every day we have the opportunity to do that. And so here at uh, Grace Church, this Christmas, we want to kind of raise the bar. We want to step up together and make it a complete, it's not about me Christmas. And uh, to do that, if you're new to Grace, uh, you're kind of familiar with the term uh, greatest, or you're not familiar with the term greatest gift Christmas offering. If you've been around Grace for a couple years, you're maybe more familiar with this. This is a time at Christmas where we decide to go sacrificial. We keep giving regularly. We keep doing our reoccurring gift, but we sacrifice and go above and beyond and we take our offering all Christmas season, and portions of those gifts go to help ministries locally, regionally, and around the world. As a matter of fact, next week we're going to talk about how some of those gifts are going to go towards Africa, and we're going to tell our experience in Africa and the story and what God has invited us to do. But today I've asked Pastor Dave Lawson to join me out here on stage because I've asked Pastor Dave to lead a campaign for us, which is going to be a portion of the greatest gift Christmas offering. Some of the money that we receive in this offering is going to go towards this campaign. It's going to be called uh, the Give Joy Campaign. So let's welcome Pastor Dave to the stage this morning. That's right. Thank you for leading this. Tell us a little bit about what is the Give Joy campaign and why is it important? Well, the reason it's important to us, I think, is because it's important to our community. And our church has been put here for the purpose of being an encouragement and a blessing to our community. Uh, Jesus talked about joy and talked about its relationship with us when he said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus added value to people through his joy. And for those of us who know Jesus, we have him residing in us, and therefore we have his joy residing in us. And so whenever we give joy, we also add value to people. Add value. Yes. I like that phrase. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I like it because Jesus did it, as you said. He yeah. constantly added value to people's lives. And so how in this Give Joy campaign will we add value to other people's lives? Well, I did a little research on this, and, and one of the things I discovered was that in the Bible, the word for grace and the word for joy are really, really closely related, so closely related that sometimes it's hard to distinguish the meaning between the two. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the point? Well, the point is that grace and joy belong together. They go together. In a blog post that I wrote for this week, it's like they go together like peanut butter and jelly, like macaroni and cheese, like the Cleveland Browns and losses. I mean, they just kind of go together. Those do go together. They do go yes, together. They do. And so why is that important? Well, the reason it's important is because it gives a whole new perspective and meaning to our service. The Apostle Peter wrote this about service. He said, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So what he's telling us there is that each of us has been given, a, a, equipped with a special means to serve others. And then when we do serve, we extend grace and we reflect grace, God's glory, uh, in its various forms to people. And when we do that then, because we're extending grace, we are also extending joy because grace and joy belong together. So we add value by using our gift yeah, to make right. a difference in other people's serving. lives. Right. Okay, so what can we expect will happen in this campaign? How is that going to be fleshed out? Well, I think that's the most exciting part because okay. um, here's kind of what I envision. I envision individuals and groups and ministry teams just trying to figure out how is it that we can extend these uh, services of grace and joy to people and then I envision uh, families being around their dinner table at night, and they're kind of scheming even about how they're going to bring joy to people on their block or on their, their street or whatever it might be. Uh, I think about adults who are strategizing every day about how they can bring joy to their workplace through faith-filled acts of service. I think of uh, even children, you know, talking to their parents and saying, Mom, Dad, how can I bring joy to my classmates or to my friends at school and talking about that? You know, the, the, the malls are crowded, the, the stores are crowded, the drive throughs are long and windy. I, you know, I'm thinking about those of us who are part of Grace Church being in those lines, waiting patiently, and uh, have, being kind of on high alert about how can I extend joy through an act of service hmm. in this circumstance? Hmm. Now, the question is, how is it that we are able to do that? Well, the reason we're able to do that is because joy does not depend upon my personality. It depends upon the person I know. And so when I have Jesus residing in me, I, I kind of am carrying joy with me wherever I go. It's an expression of my lifestyle. 
Now, I think where this is going to get really exciting, at least for me, hopefully you can see this too. Uh, over the next four weeks, wouldn't it be great if there were 10,000 deliveries of joy? Amen. Where uh, our, we at Grace Church, many of us are already praying that, we, that God would use our lives to be an encouragement to five people. What if we extended a package of joy, a, a gift of joy through faith-filled service into somebody's life, those five people that maybe we're asking God to use our lives in, and, and bring them joy 10,000 times over the next four weeks. Wouldn't that be great? 10,000? 10, 10,000. That sounds yeah. a bit ridiculous if you ask me. 10,000? Yeah. Well, so where are we, we even get the ideas oh. to bless or to give joy to 10,000 people? Well, I, I'm that kind of person. I kind of need ideas to kind of feed off of. And okay. so uh, selfishly, I know it's not about me, but selfishly, uh, I would like everyone here uh, in this venue and in our other venue, maybe even online, if you're using the app, to write down... Uh, your idea about how you would like to extend joy into the life of somebody else. And we'll collect those ideas. We're going to put them on our website, kind of like an idea bank. Okay. And so if you're looking for opportunities, maybe these, can, these ideas of other people can might spawn other ideas for you. And so then after we post those ideas, whenever you deliver a package of joy, a gift of joy to somebody through an act of service, we'd like you to let us know, report on that for us so that uh, we can record this glory that our church is giving to God through these acts of service. Now, you can do it electronically. You can go to the Connect Room or you can go to uh, the table outside the traditional service and you can find out more about how to report those acts of joy. Awesome. So today's the launch of the Give Joy campaign. Let's thank Pastor Dave for coming up here this morning. So a portion of what we collect through the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering will go to help offset some of these opportunities. And I'll tell you, I wanted to practice this this week a little bit, and so I was a part of a little uh, gathering of people, a little club that I'm in, and uh, I decided to bring donuts for everybody. I swung through Dunkin' Donuts, true story, and I got a box, a dozen of donuts, and on the box it says, Joy. So you can give joy a lot at Christmas through the form of sugar and glazed and whatever kind you like, right? But anyway, a great example. I'm sure you have tons of creativity and we want to know about it. Why? Because we want to reflect Jesus to our community. What if 2017, Grace Church, what if we could give joy to 10,000 people in our community? We can do it. If all of us just step up and do five, some of you I know, man, you've already, you've probably thought of five already. You're going to do 20 today. That's how you are. That's awesome. Not to be about us, but to be about him. And so people can see that. If you want to flip your Christmas upside down and make it a not about me Christmas, resemble and reflect Jesus. Contemplate the glory of the Lord. And so today I want us to take our next steps together. Would you do me a favor? Would you bow your head? Close your eyes, but open your hearts wide open to God this morning. There are people living without God all around us in our community. They will one day breathe their last breath. They will die and they will spend forever somewhere. People need hope. Those who follow Christ, we have hope. Picture a, a dark night. You're driving down the street and you see a house with Christmas lights on. Lights that light up the darkness. What if in a world that is filled with hopelessness and is dark... Grace Church would leave the building today like lights setting the night on fire so that people could see the reason for the hope that we have. I got to tell you that you can only resemble Jesus after you've received him. You, you can't try harder to be perfect or do the rituals or to try to behave, to earn God's love and forgiveness, it doesn't work like that. You just receive it as a gift. It's the greatest gift ever given. And you can receive that right here this morning, right now. You can have a conversation quietly from your heart to God's. You just talk to Him. It's called prayer. 
you could say something like this. You could repeat after me. Just say, God, thank you for loving me. I know that I've blown it. I've sinned. Thanks for Jesus dying on the cross in my place. I need your forgiveness, and I receive it. I give you complete control of my life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, can I ask you, if you just had that conversation with God right now where you are, would you do me a favor? Will you just slip your hand up so only I can see it? Will you just raise your hand? Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. The Bible says that that conversation changes your life. Jesus now lives inside of you. And his spirit is going to change you more and more and more to look like his son. And I would love to know, if you raised your hand, I would ask you just to do one more favor for me. Before you leave today, if you would find that card that Pastor Dave was talking about a second ago, it's inside the program you were handed when you walked in, would you just write the name Jesus on that card? That would indicate that you had that conversation with God today. If you've already taken that step, your next step might be to resemble Jesus. You need to spend some time in the Word of God this Christmas. Maybe you need to sign up for that Every Day with God devotional experience or to make a commitment for the next 30 days. If you were to spend time in the Word of God and allowing God's Spirit to change you for 30 straight days, you'd go straight through Christmas. You talk about a season that would be not about you. It will change you. If you're going to take that challenge, I encourage you on that response card just to write every day with God. I think all of us can together take the next step of reflecting Jesus. And I want to challenge us as a church to consider going sacrificial in the greatest gift Christmas offering. Together to make a difference so that we can give joy to 10,000 people in our community. Meaningful sacrificial, intentional, and relational connections with people. If you're ready to take that challenge, you can just write on that response card or on the Grace Church app. Just write, give joy. And make sure to write down your creative ideas too so we can put them in the idea bank. May this Christmas truly be not about us. God, I pray today that we would set the darkness ablaze. That we would canter, uh, carry the banner of love this Christmas. God, may we make it a not about me Christmas. God, I ask today that you would move in our spirits and guide and direct us to take our next steps. God, I believe that if we take the it's not about me Christmas challenge, that our lives will become richer because we will be using our gifts for your name and your sake and your fame and your glory. And I believe that our church will be stronger because together we will unite to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. And I know that our community will be better. And the reason I know that is because they will see They will see Jesus resembled and reflected. God, what if Grace Church was responsible for Wayne County contemplating the glory of the Lord this Christmas? We'd have to give you all the credit and the fame. We ask for you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching with us today. We hope it's been helpful and motivating to live the life God created you to have. Share with us your next step through your app or use the app to ask questions or share a prayer request. You're always invited to join us on our campus for weekend services. Until next Sunday, though, have a great week.